Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking a look at a French Epee bayonet model of 1886, Rosalie, for the French 1886 Lebel rifle. So these were manufactured by uh, a number of French uh, state arms manufacturers. They were made by uh, Manufactured Arms Saint Etienne, MAS, uh, Manufactured National d'Arms de Chateauroux, MAC, and um, I no doubt they're made by a couple of uh, others that I've been able to track down. I assume Toulouse probably made a couple as well. Uh, and then during World War One, a bunch of uh, French private contractors were used to um, make parts for them. So World War One production models, you'll find um, commercial markings on various pieces. So the history behind this bayonet, very good history. In 1886, uh, France changed the world with the development of smokeless powder. And immediately they identified we need to make a rifle fast before our competitors uh, are able to catch up so we have a leading edge in firearms development. So France back in the day, uh, they, they were not good at developing things quickly. They managed to get a prototype together in uh, five months, which is absolutely a lightning speed for France. Um, back then they, they usually used to order a, a bunch of trials with uh, a ridiculous number of contenders and then they wouldn't choose anyone and then they'd do another trial and then eventually they'd pick a couple people or a couple designs they liked and they'd tell them to uh, put them together and make some kind of hybrid and they wouldn't pay royalties to the designers and it was an ongoing long drawn out process that took absolutely forever. That wasn't the case with the label. With the label it was just pedal to the metal and uh, in five months they had a working prototype and then bang straight into production. And while it wasn't the best prototype, I mean, it had a, a tube magazine instead of um, stripper clips or uh, clip fed or anything like that, which uh, was a bit of a disadvantage when you had to single load uh, rounds. But you know, at the, at the time that was perfectly fine. It was a bit obsolete by uh, World War One, but at the time it was completely fine. So at the time of the, the development of this bayonet, uh, it was still believed that um, infantry would meet each other upon the field of combat in extended lines, march towards each other, fire a few shots, and then the man with the longer bayonet would win because he would reach the enemy before they reached him. So France had a history of using very, very long bayonets with the Chasseau and the Gras, uh, and that certainly hasn't changed here. So if you're familiar with the La Belle rifle, uh, that's an incredibly long rifle to begin with. And then they stuck this absolute beast of a bayonet on the end of it, which uh, has a 52 centimeter blade, which is ginormous. So you put those two things together and the French, they, they could very, very easily outreach the Germans. Um, unfortunately, as much of an advantage as that was uh, on the, uh, the field of combat, uh, that wasn't reality. And in World War One, when these were used in the trenches, it was incredibly impractical. Um, I read accounts that French soldiers weren't able to turn around in the uh, the trenches if they had their rifle at the ready and uh, they'd have to bring it to a high port to turn around. And it was quite common for French soldiers to uh, cut them down uh, drastically into short little fighting knives or for them to be uh, snapped or broken in the field and uh, shortened down. Anyway, they, they were shortened down for a number of reasons. I'll get into that shortly. But... Um, these replaced uh, the Gras rifle and the Epe bayonet for the Gras. Uh, Epe being French for sword. I've got a copy, I was trying to copy a, a Gras bayonet here, an Epe bayonet for the Gras. As you can see, it's got an incredibly long blade, just like what I've got here. And it's got a T-section style blade. Now, the reason that this uh, is called um, the Epe is it's actually modeled after the Epe de Combat, a fencing sword, a fencing style sword. And um, well, the Gras bayonet here is called the Epe uh, bayonet, model of 1874. They maintain that name with the Labelle bayonet here being the Epe bayonet, model of 1886. So that's why it's called Epe. Epe is French for sword. Um, where am I up to? So before World War I, after the Franco-Prussian War, France had suffered a very humiliating defeat and um, they, were, they were quite upset. And well, the general popu uh, population, they weren't happy with uh, where France was standing in Europe and there was a strong sense of resentment. And there was a lot of uh, French propaganda at the time sort of pointing the finger at Germany saying all oh, this resentment is because of Germany, everything bad is because of Germany. And um, 
they started to produce a lot of propaganda. And shortly before the First World War, um, who was it, Theodore uh, Botel uh, wrote a song about uh, re pretty much romanticising um, bayonets and the use of bayonets against the Germans, stating that um, the, the Germans will uh, be swarmed by French soldiers and fall uh, before the, uh, the tips of our bayonets. And uh, they really, really romanticised the idea of the bayonet. And um, they really had the opinion that their, their bayonets were absolutely gorgeous and not just gorgeous they were they were functional being a cruciform blade would inflict a huge amount of damage and they should be incredibly feared by the germans and um the germans response to all of this propaganda was uh we're not afraid of your knitting needles so it didn't really phase them too much at all now there were a number of uh, modifications um well i won't say modifications because they didn't modify existing stock Changes in the development. So when they were producing these, there were changes in the uh, the manufacturing as they went along. So the initial version, which is what I have here, the 1886, um, has a number of issues with it. I'll go through most of them with the construction of the blade. I'll go through them now. So the first issue, and this is uh, quite a considerable one, is the lock and catch here. It's got a rotating lock and catch. Is very, very narrow, as you can see. So there were complaints that uh, when fired, this would disconnect and the bayonet would uh, fall off the rifle as a result of the recoil. Now, that's not the best uh, thing to happen at the best of times, but um, this blade is uh, very, very slender and very, very fragile. So they made the blade as long as they possibly could and... Um, they made it as light as they possibly could. And in order to make it as light and long as you can, you make a cruciform blade. As far as I know, it's one of the first cruciform blades out there, or one of the first in such huge production. But it was also very, very brittle and very prone to snapping. So when they were firing their rifles and the bayonets were falling off as a result of recoil, and bayonets were snapping when they touched the ground or hit the ground, they realized they had a pretty severe problem. So in 1893, a number of modifications were made to the design, and uh, that's what I have here, a 83 model. I'll go through that in a second. Sorry, a 93 model. The other issues with the, uh, the bayonet were there was no real tang. So the tang only comes down about 8 millimeters where my thumb is now, and it screws in. And that makes it very, very weak, very, very weak connection. You can actually feel it. It's a bit wobbly, and it, it just doesn't feel very secure or strong at all. So that's something else that was addressed. And there was also an issue with uh, soldiers having their fingers slide off the catch. So they um, increased the checkering as well. So then you've got the, uh, the 93 variant here. You've got a nice long full tang that goes all the way to the end and has a screw down the bottom, which the other does not. You need a special tool to take that off. I do not have one. Uh, you've got the push button with extra checkering. Uh, this is worn off. This is, as you can see, it's nearly gone. So you can't see the more pronounced checkering here. But then, most importantly, our lock and catch has doubled in size. That is not coming off when you fire the rifle. Or at least you hope not. And there were a couple other modifications after that in 1915, mid-World War I. Um, due to a, a number of uh, shortages, uh, they did away with the German silver, nickel alloy handles, and use brass and even cast iron. Cast iron ones are very hard to find if you uh, have one, lucky you. And they did away with the hook quillins because um, it's determined that hooks, they're not practically used to catch enemy bayonets in a duel. Uh, realistically, they're getting caught on barbed wire, they're getting caught on the straps on your gear, they're getting caught on uh, rope on the ground, they're getting caught when you're moving your, your uh, bayonet around or taking it off your, your kit. They were just getting caught on everything and they deemed to be very, very impractical. So they were removed and let's face it, they weren't the only ones doing this. The British did this. Uh, virtually everyone was taking quillens off of bayonets because, um, yeah, they, they just weren't very practical. Uh, and then again in uh, 1935, there was a official modification where they made these nice and short down to a uniform length. I'm not sure what that length is, but it's much shorter than what we have here. And... Um, in World War II, when France fell, a huge number of these fell into the hands of the Germans, and the Germans cut them down to a uniform length. They got a scabbard that um, had a rounded bottom, and um, 
they issued them to their their own forces under the uh, the name the Sight and Guerrera 103 and 102. I think that's what they were. Two separate names. And uh, Sight and Guerrera is German for um, sidearm. That's what they called their, their bayonets. They called them sidearms. Um, if I mispronounced uh, Sight and Guerrera, which I promise you I have, please don't hassle me too much in the comments, my Australian tongue. As I always carry on, is uh, not very good with uh, other languages, German, French. Um, anyway, uh, during the war, uh, a number of these were um, damaged and bent and all kinds of things. So it's not too uncommon to find one that's um, got some tinting along the blade. And that's usually where it's been bent and it's been heated and reshaped or re-straightened. That's pretty common. Uh, it's also pretty common to find them cut down to a non-uniform length. Um, and that's usually the result of one that's snapped. And... Um, yeah, it's just been resharpened and uh, had the scabbard taken down to an appropriate length. Uh, in the war, they weren't terribly popular as bayonets because um, they tended to get stuck in people, they tended to snap off in people, they tended to snap off at inconvenient times. Um, yeah, they were, they were... Look, they were popular because uh, they were beautiful and they were popular because they made... Um, great stabbers and they were light and they were they were quite often cut down into like a six inch little um, fighting knife and I've seen a, a photo from the trenches where uh, one's been cut down to a, a nice short length stabbed into the wall of the trench and they've actually hung a lantern from the hook quillen which I thought was pretty cool pretty practical but that's no, an absolutely uh, gorgeous bayonet uh, definitely one of my favorites I think I say that about every bayonet I've reviewed so far, but it always seems to be true. So I might jump into the construction of the blade. So we've got a 52 centimetre cruciform blade, extremely long, very, very um, thin, very light. Uh, I don't want to try bending it because I'm very afraid it'd snap. It's very brittle. Uh, they're nice um, cross guard, big hooked quillen. Um, muzzle ring with the cut recess at the top there. We've got a rotating push button with a nice big circular button. And uh, the German uh, silver handle, which is obviously nickel. And the originals are easy to spot because the pommel, base of the pommel looks like this, just the one dot in the middle. Where the later versions look like that. They've got that disc with the two recesses in it that you can screw off to get to the tang. And then the scabbard, it's just a tubular scabbard with a ball finale at the end. Uh, and then it's got a frog bar at the top. I believe that's correct terminology, a little bar for the, the frog to attach to. It would usually come with a leather frog. And a little ball finale at the end there. So that's the original, the uh, 93. I think I've already gone over the differences. Just got a tang that goes all the way through, the bigger button, um, the more pronounced checkering, which is all worn off on this example. And uh, then the 1915 modification, obviously had the brass handle, the uh, cast iron handle, did away with the hook quillen. And uh, this part here was just flat, just flush. And then obviously the uh, 1935, or the R35 they called it, was nice and short. Might jump into the markings. So, serial numbers are found on the quillen, and then on the later versions where the quillen are removed, on the flat surface just here, where the quillen would be. And uh, serial numbers match rifles. So if you can find uh, an online register or a book or anything with a year of production for a rifle per serial number, you'll be able to track down when these were made as well. Serial number has a couple of letter prefixes at the front, which you find on a lot of the um, French bayonets. And then it has a couple other markings on it too. So I'll show you the other one, because this one, the markings are quite worn. So I'll show you the serial number in this one first. So you've got the serial number here on the hook, and then you'll find a matching serial number on, where are we, on the scabbard, on the base of the scabbard, base of the frog bar. Uh, this one's not matching, bugger. Then you'll also find a number of other markings. Uh, you'll have letters with circles on them. 
don't fall over please. I've got a couple just here above the catch. And what they represent, they're stamps for the director of manufacture and the factory controller. So depending on which stamps you have, and if you have uh, a book or some kind of reference material, you can track down what factory they came out of and uh, what time based on who the uh, director of manufacture and factory controllers were, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, then we also have a number of uh, circles with um, letters in them. Let's see if I can find them. Just give me a moment. Oh, sorry, shields with uh, letters in them. And these are control stamps. So first, second, and third class uh, controller stamps. And you'll find a number of those on these bayonets too. Uh, I've only found the one on this one. The other's got a couple, but they're very worn and very hard to find. You'll also find these uh, circular marks for the uh, director and uh, controller on the scabbard. I'll show you where those are now. Uh, focus, please. There we go. Very faintly stamped, but just there. Some of the other stamps you can come across on these, if you find an anchor, it means they've been issued to colonial troops. Um, I want to get my hands on one of those, so I haven't uh, got one. And uh, yeah, you can find uh, commercial manufacturer's markings on various parts, um, as I said, for World War I manufactured blades. So yeah, these were used uh, all throughout the First World War, the Second World War, and uh, they're used by French colonial uh, troops around the world in various colonial conflicts. Uh, generally, they didn't last long after World War II. They were pretty obsolete by World War II. Honestly, they were pretty obsolete by uh, World War One. But they were replaced by um, the Master 36, uh, which had a little spike bayonet, a little reversible spike bayonet, as well as the, um, the Bertier. So in the First World War, uh, these weren't just fixed to Lebel rifles, they were also fixed to Bertiers. And I know when you think of the Bertier, you think of the Bertier bayonet, which is a little knife knife bayonet with a very different locking mechanism a button at the bottom well you'll find Bertier um, rifles with this style of attachment and you'll also find um, these bayonets with this kind of locking mechanism so my understanding is all of the bayonets made from 1915 onwards throughout the war they were made to fit Bertier rifles because Bertier rifle had uh, a clip. It was clip fed instead of tube. So you could load a whole clip of rounds instead of one at a time into a tube and that was deemed to be um, better, more efficient. But yeah, those are the, the rifles that replaced the label and replaced this bayonet, which is a shame because uh, absolutely gorgeous if a little impractical in the trenches. So yeah, guys, uh, if I've missed anything or made any uh, grave errors, please comment below. I'd love to hear from you, and uh, thanks for watching.